This is an exclusive excerpt from the Stuff File program with Peter Anthony Holder. Gothic horror novelist Jennifer Ann Gordon is back on the program. She's here to talk about her latest book, which is a collection of stories. The book is called The Japanese Box. Jennifer joins us via Skype from New Hampshire. Hi, Jennifer. Hello. Thank you for having me back. Um, you mentioned the name of the book, and just on instinct, I picked up my nearest copy and held it up near my face like I was on camera. <laughs> so then I was just like, oh, you don't need to do that. You're trying too hard. Now, we, we spoke to you a couple of times uh, previously when um, some of your previous books came out. And I remember you were talking about the fact that you grew up in a town where you were living close to a cemetery, and this is where you and your friends used to play. And uh, and I guess like I was... normal children do. Exactly. Yeah. And I guess I was asking the question about basically how you got into horror and whatnot. So I'm going to re-ask that question in a different way. Were you a dark girl? Were you the Wednesday of your group when you were growing up? Oh, uh, I was not that cool. So I will start right off by saying I was not as cool as Wednesday. But I was, uh, you know, I, I grew up in a, a kind of conservative area. So I was the one reading Nancy Drew. I was the one um, watching Alfred Hitchcock presents in black and white in reruns. I was watching Creature, Creature Double Feature. Uh, Saturday afternoons out of our local station in Boston. So I think I was like a little bit darker than my friends, but it wasn't until um, I accidentally read Stephen King's Pet Cemetery when I was 10, thinking it was a book about a cat, <laughs> uh, and then realizing very quickly it was not a book about a cat and wanting to read it even more. That, I think, is when I realized I was not reading the same books as my friends because they were just like, did you read the latest Babysitter's Club? And I was like, uh oh, I did not. I read Pet Cemetery. Okay, so I, I now have to do a deeper dive. Uh, this is the year of the film uh, Barbie. So I'm just curious to know what happened to your Barbies when you were a girl? Or did you even have them? I did have Barbies. Um, I'm sorry, you cut out a little bit, so I hope that's the question and I'm not just like going to go on about the Barbie movie. No, I was going to ask, what happened to your Barbies when you were growing up? Okay, so my Barbies growing up, I was never allowed to have a Ken because my parents thought, you know, I would do maybe something gross with it. I'm not sure. Uh, but instead, I did like a lot of gross things with my Barbies. Well, that's what I was getting at. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the games that I played were murder victim Barbie. <laughs> and, I, and I had a Brooke Shields doll. Because so this is I'm dating myself, and she was a little larger than Barbie and a little broader than Barbie. So Brooke Shields was the lady detective who always stumbled on the scene of all of these dead and half clothed Barbies. I'm going to have to write to Mattel to see if they're going to come up with a murder victim Barbie. I think that's great. Murder victim Barbie <laughs> should be in Barbie too. Uh, I can give them all of the ideas that I had that were just really gruesome and honestly i don't know where i got the ideas because they were gruesome in a wholesome way which is just like oh just like and i took scissors to like their clothes and ripped them up a little bit and one time i put ketchup all over like four of them and my parents were so mad because it obviously got on the carpet obviously <laughs> well let's yeah. we, <laughs> because we, i was seven we we really need to get to your book so let's talk about the japanese box and other stories this is a collection of stories so how did you go about deciding what went into a collection do is there a thematic yeah. situation through every story or is or, or they do do they all live on their own so to speak um they yes yes and no so this started, the Japanese box and other stories started not really as a collection. I wrote the flagship story, the Japanese box, uh, in a memoir and grief writing class. Uh, so it started, honestly, as a personal essay about uh, a night that my dad showed me all of his memorabilia from the Korean War in the time he spent in Japan. So it started just as an essay and I think because I got scared of all of that emotion, I thought to myself, like, well, why don't I just creep this up a little bit and add a ghost in the TV set? Like, because that's easier to deal with for me. So the Japanese box became this weird 
kind of memoir, kind of creative nonfiction uh, exploration of what it's like to be a 10-year-old girl to a 40-something-year-old woman told through horror metaphor. So I, I wrote that, and I submitted it to Last World's Publishing, uh, my publisher for this book, as a short story that maybe they would want to put in an anthology. And and they were lovely. They loved it a lot. And they said, it's really long, and it's it's really good. Send us something else. So I sent them the, the short story, The Lithium Moon, which is my take on a werewolf story, but really it's about uh, mental illness and pregnancy, and trying to become a mother. Uh, and then they read that and they were like, okay, do you have anything else? So I just kept sending them stories thinking, okay, they're going to hit on one that they want to put in a, in a collection, like in an anthology with other authors. And then all of a sudden it became, I think we should put all of these in a book together. Wow. And I said, well, then now I have to get my agent on the phone because I'm allowed to submit stories places, but I'm not allowed to pitch a book. So all of a sudden we had a book um, and it was just, it was weird and exciting. So yes, I think I tend to write a lot of what I would call identity horror and creative nonfiction grief horror, uh, which, you know, kind of all can go under the umbrella of Gothic fiction. Hmm. So all of these, all of the stories and the, the one poem in the Japanese box and other stories, they are very much an exploration of who you are at certain moments in your life. You know, I've had the, uh, I'm going to use an analogy here, I've had the pleasure of, of uh, talking with, uh, chatting with, hanging with some experienced actors who have spent most of their careers playing villains. And I've always found that when I talk to these particular actors, the ones who play villains who you would, if you were to walk down the street, you would probably cross the street because you've seen them in something. These... And then they're the sweetest people. Exactly. They're the sweetest, happiest, nicest people you'll ever meet. And I'm just wondering, because every time I've had a chance to talk to you, you're absolutely delightful, but yet you write horror. (laughs) So I'm just wondering, are are you the same situation? I am. So my day job and my day job for the past 14 years, I guess, I don't do math, uh, has been a professional ballroom dance instructor and a professional ballroom dance performer. And my favorite dance is the Foxtrot, which is a super happy, fun dance. And all of my students, when my first book came out, thought it was going to be a romance. (laughs) And then they, they, because they are just, they know me as like, do the foxtrot oh my god flirt with each other let's do this remember hips sexy blah blah um and then they read my first book and they were just like oh no honey what is happening in your head (laughs) i'm like well yeah it's a flip side it's you know the two sides to every coin you can be creepy dark wednesday adams uh doing murder barbie and you can also be a little girl who's always wanted to be in the nut well as as a writer, because, uh, again, the last time we had you on, we were talking about your book, Pretty Ugly. And uh, you mentioned in the fact that it was something uh, that was uh, uh, a story that took a long time and that the characters kept talking to you. And that's why you had to finally release them, so to speak. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm just wondering, do does that happen on a regular basis? Are, do you have to... Uh, sp- literally spew the characters that are in your head because if they if you don't they won't go away. Yeah, I would say yes for sure, but I'll also say it takes my brain a long time to like percolate characters and stories. So I have like I my husband always laughs and he's like I have ten novels in my head that at any point in any time of the day I'm going back to a specific moment. And I'm just waiting for those characters to really fully develop. Like they have to like become real. And then my writing process, it's very fast. When I start to write just based off an idea without building all of that character stuff first, it's much harder. It takes a long time. 
But if I wait, you know, 20 years in my brain, then I can pump out a book in three months. As a writer, while you're writing, do you ever scare yourself? Um, not by the horror aspect of it. I do scare myself sometimes with what I think a human person can feel or do or think. Like, my scariest moments have come from writing things that are not horror, either creative nonfiction memoir, or even I have a book kind of out there in the universe right now that, you know, hopefully will get picked up, which is women's fiction. And that was much scarier. Diving into the way people really treat each other on a day-to-day basis, I found much scarier than any ghost I've created. Mm. Um, the book is called The Japanese Box and Other Stories. It's your latest book. It's an anthology. Are you still uh, co-hosting Vox Vomitus, the, the podcast? Yes, I am. We are. We we used to be diehard every week, 52 weeks a year. Uh, but then my co-host, Allison Martine, and I realized we were exhausted and we can't read as many books as we needed to read. So now... Um, we're usually about every other week, but we did just have uh, best-selling author Paul Tremblay on last night. And uh, yeah, Vox Wominus, you can find us on Facebook, you can find us on YouTube. Uh, you know, we're really lucky we get to talk to some of the best writers in the business and just ask them what went wrong. <laughs> and now we wear costumes sometimes when we, because we're a video podcast. So yesterday I wore like fuzzy ears. <laughs> <laughs> because Chris Paul's book was called The Beast You Are, and it had a lot of animals in it. So we dressed up like animals. We're like the carrot top of literary comedy <laughs> podcasts. Well, <laughs> Jennifer, it is always a sheer delight to have you on the program. Again, the latest book is The Japanese Box. Thank you for being on the show once again. Thank you so much for having me. You are always such a delight to talk to, and I just adore you. So anytime. I will be back. Jennifer Ann Gordon, author of The Japanese Box. I adore that woman. You can go to my website at thestufffile.com, check out the show number for this program, which is show number 0732, and you'll find the links to Jennifer's site, plus links to either amazon.com or amazon.ca, where you can order her book directly. You'll also find a link to the podcast she co-hosts called Vox Vomitus, which features discussions with other authors. And thanks to Jennifer, I now can't get Murder Victim Barbie out of my head. I hope you're listening, Mattel. You've just heard an exclusive excerpt from the Stuff File program with Peter Anthony Holder. To hear any or all of the full hour-long shows, visit thestufffile.com. Stuff is spelled S-T-U-P-H. That's thestufffile.com. A presentation of Flying Fish Communications.